Well, hello, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this meeting of the APPDG on uh, town centres. We thought we'd have an extra session um, on the levelling up paper. Uh, and so I'm not going to say any more because I think a number of people have seen it. Uh, it obviously represents the first stage of the government's ambition to uh, define what levelling up means uh, and how it might uh, directly work uh, in any number of areas, but particularly we're interested in its impact on high streets, town centre communities uh, and town centres. And so I'm going to ask OJ to uh, walk us through uh, some of the uh, initial thoughts and summary. And then Andrew Lawson from the York Beard is going to talk us through some of the thoughts that they have and some of the perspectives about whether or not um, it is the right pointing in the right direction uh, for, for levelling up the country. OJ, over to you. Uh, oh, sorry, just housekeeping points to people. Um, if you could stay on mute, um, and when we get to the Q&A, please come off and say who you are. Uh, and also, if you want to make any comments as we go through, please do use the chat function. OJ, sorry, over to you. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Stephen. Um, thanks a lot, everybody, for joining us for this important session, like Stephen says. Um, this wasn't originally in the um, um, schedule, but we thought it's such an important topic in terms of its impact on high streets across the UK, that it was worth us taking time to explore it. So as a quick su summary, Leveling Up White Paper wow. in the UK was published on the 2nd of February. According to the UK government, this is a moral, social and economic programme for the whole uh, of government to spread opportunity more equally. Um, and for a long time, we've been wondering um, what that has meant. Now, the rationale for this is for a long time, um, investment has been um, lopsided in different forms. And I'm just plucking some of the analysis from uh, the beginning of the paper to use here. So research and development, for example, largely targeted towards um, London, the east and the southeast. Um, and that has its impacts on terms of uh, outcomes with productivity being one of the main sort of metrics used to understand uh, living standards in the UK with again London and the South East coming out um, on uh, top. With many other areas, Wales, coastal communities, Southwest, um, some areas across the North not faring so well. Um, so that's the, the general picture in terms of uh, productivity, and that has an impact. Um, productivity is believed to directly um, relate to the performance of um, business output, impacting business profitability, salaries, and then indirectly impacting things like wealth, health, and overall quality of life. And it's um, this economic disparity in terms of something like prop um productivity is not new it has been around for decades so what the government says by leveling up is trying to resolve a problem that has been there for a, at least a generation so it's no small task um, and clearly the the, the the size and the comprehensive nature of the white paper suggests that the government is looking seriously at how it can resolve this challenge so the white paper is structured around four key objectives. Um, these four objectives are to boost productivity, pay jobs and living standards by growing the private sector, especially in those places where they are lagging. Secondly is to spread opportunities and improve public services, especially in those places where they are weakest. Third is to restore a sense of community, local pride and belonging especially in those places where they have been lost. And finally, is to empower local leaders and communities, especially in those places lacking local agency. Um, now, there are 12 missions which are split between these um, four objectives. And I think one of the positives about the paper is that these missions are clear. They make it clear what the government wants to achieve. And they're clear enough that hopefully we are able to monitor progress against these objectives to both support the government in achieving what it wants to deliver but also hold it to account where we think um, the necessary work isn't going in the right direction 
So I've just selected a key few um, of these missions, the ones which I think are probably most relevant to um, high streets and town centres in no particular order, but I'm putting this one top. Um, is the mission on pride of place by 2030 pride in place such as people's satisfaction in their town center and engagement in local culture and community will have risen in every area of the uk with the gap between top performing and other areas closing there's one on transport by 2030 local public transport connectivity across the country will be significantly closer to the standards of london with improved services, simpler fares and integrated ticketing. There's one on wellbeing. By 2030, wellbeing will have improved in every area of the UK with the gap between top performing and other areas closing. And crime as well. By 2030, homicide, serious violence and neighbourhood crime will have fallen, focused on the worst affected areas. Uh, and finally, and this one is England specific, it's uh, devolution. So by 2030, every part of England that wants one will have a devolution deal with powers at or approaching the highest level of devolution and a simplified long term funding settlement. So um, largely within the latter parts of the um, report, especially around um, the mission of Pride in Place, there's a number of high street related um, announcements which are new. Um, which we've learned through the white paper. Firstly, and, and I think nearly all of these will relate to England because um, in terms of high street policy, it is where the UK uh, government has power when it comes to high streets, the devolved nations will have um, power to um, put forward their own policy. Um, so for England, the white paper announces that the UK government will proactively identify and engage with 20 places in England that demonstrate strong leadership and ambition where the impact of in existing investment can be maximised to catalyse economic transformation. Now, we know of two of these 20 places. Um, that will be Wolverhampton, um, where we've actually seen um, a new um, office, a new HQ for the department for levelling up actually uh, be based, and also Sheffield as well. And Homes England will be leading, um, will be the leading agency in this regeneration. There is also the High Streets Task Force, which is being expanded with an additional 68 local authorities receiving expert support, um, with some towns being mentioned, such as Dudley and South, uh, South End, um, Taunton, etc. The white paper announces that the UK government will incentivise landlords to fill vacant units by giving local authorities the power to require landlords to rent out vacant properties to prospective tenants. Um, there's no more details than that at the moment in the white paper, but that is something we wait uh, to hear more on because that is a, a particularly tricky issue. Um, so we wait, we wait to see more details on that. The white paper announces that the UK government will consider new ownership and management models and locally determined access targets to improve access to the outdoors in towns and cities across the UK. Um, sounds positive. Again, we have to wait to see more of the details. Um, and then I think it's fair to say, actually, most of the rest of the paper is just a reiteration of existing policies and funding programmes. Um, and so just to highlight the ones um, which are most relevant to high streets and town centres, um, there is the Leveling Up Fund, um, of course, which uh, looks at um, investing in capital infrastructure to improve everyday life uh, and has a tangible impact on local places. And that's allocating 4.8 billion um, up to the year 24-25. Um, there is the continuation of COVID support, including uh, temporary business rates relief, um, streamlined outdoor trading licenses for hospitality, and permitted development rights for, for new high street homes. Um, I think all three of those topics we have covered very recently in previous APPG meetings. Um, some positive, some not so positive. Uh, there's the local growth funds as well, 3.6 billion. Um, Towns Fund, um, which includes the uh, Towns deal, 
um, and also the future high streets fund um, which is money already circulating and then of course there's the uk shared prosperity fund which aims to increase live chances and build pride in place in the uk by empowering places to invest in local um, priorities um, across the three priority areas of communities and place people and skills and local business um, so that's that's a very quick whistle stop tour of uh, the white paper um, ATCM has been doing a lot of work in recent weeks on understanding the views of industry um, to get a sense of how the white paper is being received. On the 3rd of March, we met with our members, so that's town and city management professionals across the UK, across the public and private sector to understand their views. And on the 14th of March, we chaired a meeting of the High Streets Task Force Sector Leaders Group. Um, which includes all the main uh, key trade associations across the sector from retail, uh, markets, property, uh, etc. So in terms of comments, there's so much feedback we've had back, which is really incredibly useful. And it's difficult to summarise it all. And I, I, I make no bones that some of this might be a little bit um, contradictory, but that is... Um, the nature of the beast because there have been so many comments so many people feeding in um one thing uh, that there have been some people really enthusiastic about the paper i think it's fair to say um the majority have said the white paper is underwhelming and i think far be it from me to put words in people's mouth but i just wonder if the reason why people feel underwhelmed by the white paper is because from my perspective it's not really a white paper. The purpose of a white paper is to introduce um, new policy programme, new direction of travel for the government. When you read through the levelling up white paper, it becomes fairly clear that the vast, vast majority of everything in there is stuff which is already happening. There are actually very few new announcements um, announced in the white paper. Um, and so actually, I wonder if it's an issue of branding and expectation we're all expecting lots of new announcements, lots of new things, um, which will see how communities change. But actually that's not what we've got. What we've got is mainly a reiteration of some of the things already happening. However, that being said, that doesn't mean that this white paper isn't with its uses. In fact, um, I think it, it's, it's the first time we've probably been able to see all of the government's policies, especially since the pandemic, all of the government's policies um, around town centres all in one place. And it's pretty comprehensive. Um, and looking at the range of issues being covered from skills, health, wellbeing, crime and digital connectivity actually provides a really good understanding of the direction of travel. And that in itself is useful. That in itself is useful in terms of supporting the government, in terms of delivery, um, in terms of challenging the government where we think things aren't being delivered. Um, so that just because it's not a white paper doesn't mean this is not without its use. And I think one of the things which come up as a result of all these policies being in the one document, and this has been mentioned by a number of respondents, we now start to see the overlaps between um, different policies, um, the overlaps between some of the missions, maybe areas where there might be some um, conflict. And we have to start to understand how we can ensure strong coordination to deliver on the four objectives and the 12 missions, which is made more possible by this document. So some of the things which were brought up in the High Street Task Force meeting, for example, is um, the relationship between crime and pride of place and how they come together, the relationship between net zero transition and business support and making them work together seamlessly. The white paper provides a platform for understanding some of these linkages and making sure that we can get this right as, across as many policy areas as possible. One thing that has been brought up to us a number of times is the issue of metrics and the fact that they matter. Now, I think it's, it's as positive that in terms of the missions, the government has been absolutely crystal clear in what it wants to achieve because it allows us to hold the government to account and support it where um, we can. However, what we would say is that the mission on pride of place 
is not necessarily an easy one to measure. I mean, yeah, it's probably the most important one for this industry, given it makes explicit reference to town centres. So what we need to know is how the government intends to measure pride of place so we can hold it to account and support it on delivery. So what type of metrics are going to be used? And then there's also a question mark over the use of productivity as the dominant KPI, because it can be misleading. So in the High Streets Task Force, we had a big conversation about the Southwest region, for example. One of those highlighted as being um, having lagging productivity um, in comparison to other parts of the country, not least the South East. And it's been put to us that because so much of the economy is based around the visitor economy and tourism, that is a seasonal thing. And so it is unfair to expect that the, the productivity of the Southwest will compare to areas which, where their economy isn't based on seasonality. And so you have to understand those types of comparisons when you're using KPIs and not to let something sim simplistic like productivity be the be all and end all which I think is a fair point. And the Southwest does have its challenges, but we have to be careful about the KPIs we use. The issue of representation came up. So there will be a levelling up advisory council to provide independent advice on the delivery of the objectives of the white paper, who will be working with the government. Um, and a number of people have said, we've got to get, um, the, the people on the council have got to be the right people. So multiple industry figures have stressed how important it is that that advisory council includes the voice of small businesses in the private sector and that they are a key part of that group because small business can often be underrepresented in things like that and often missed out. It's also stressed that if this is about true levelling up, there has to be plenty of representation from those communities often neglected especially coastal communities, which for too long um, probably haven't seen their fair share of investment or support over the year. There is disappointment that um, there's nothing tangible or long term on um, the issue of business rates. Yes, we've got the continuation of temporary rates relief, but we know the impact business rates has on the private sector, yet in England, but also across the UK. And it is a um, significant drain on private sector physical businesses um, and it is something that does need to be resolved um, and it would if we could do that it would make a massive difference to the leveling up agenda there is a question about whether there's enough uh, funds and investment through this um, paper um, if you are an area which is not lucky enough to have um, a pot of funding from say the leveling up fund or the local growth fund are you able to invest in the transformation that is needed in your area without that money? Do uh, councils, do the private sector have enough levers to be able to invest in a place um, without that uh, central government funding pot? And then it, 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 it's clear as we understand leveling up through this white paper, this is about trying to um, support the country with the exception of um, London. So it's looking at a re a re pivoting away from investment in London to um, other areas. Now, I absolutely agree that there's certain parts of the country that haven't had their fair share of investment and need that support. But is it wise when London is such a strategic global city that we don't give it full consideration when we are thinking about economic and social development because like all over it London does play an important part for the whole of the UK uh, in a strategic way um, so can we make this work if there isn't much of a focus on London within the white paper um, I think something else to say as well which I don't think I've included uh, in my slides is um, the issue of um, some of the practical challenges around devolution. So there is a question um, for some areas which are going under the transition of devolution, um, thanks to some of the stuff announced in the white paper, that the practical problem of funding 
because they won't yet be ready to take on that UK shared prosperity fund until the process of devolution has been completed. But this is while funding through EU sources comes to an end. So there is some concern in some areas that there will be a funding gap while that transition takes place and that's concerned. So a question to the government on how we're able to manage that funding gap and to ensure that it doesn't occur. So uh, Stephen, that's, that's it from me. So, Jay, um, I am having some, sorry, I know you a significant technology problem at this end, but I hope I'm going to manage it through the, the meeting. Uh, I keep losing hearing, but I'm trying to sort that, that uh, audio. Uh, but look, uh, thank you very much for that. Some, some really interesting points that you're raising in terms of what the town centre group are, uh, have come forward with, particularly you know, some of the comments about existing funds and whether there are enough funds enough, and some people's thoughts about what's actually in the white paper and is it enough. Andrew, uh, can I come to you next? Andrew Lawson from your bid um, to give some thoughts on the, the white paper. Andrew, good morning and you're very welcome. Yep. Thank you very much and uh, thanks for um, <clears throat> asking me to, to outline a few, um, I suppose, points on this today from the perspective of um, the Northern Bids Group. Um, I mean, just to explain to people, um, I mean, Northern Bids uh, is it's kind of like an informal group, but um, was formed back in 2016, and it kind of consists of the bid directors from the um, you know, the larger cities in the north. So uh, that includes Bradford, Chester, Leeds, Liverpool, Manchester, Newcastle, Sheffield, Sunderland, and ourselves in York. Um, and I mean, just as an overview, that you know, combined we represent around about 8,000 businesses. Um, you know, an overall RV representation of around about 105 million. And, uh, you know, we invest around about 40 million of, of private sector money um, through our bid levies, obviously, uh, as, as part of our as part of our business plan. So, um, yes, OJ, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, um, you know, said, you know, could I um, maybe, uh, you know, speak to um, the Northern Bids Group and just uh, get their views on the levelling up paper and we weren't able to do that as part of a, a group session it just missed it unfortunately but I, I you know I spoke to a few people on the phone and uh, and sent around an email and I think I mean uh, you know I don't plan to speak um, at great length today because we might tease some things out uh, as part of the discussion but I suppose uh, just, just touching a little bit on, on what OJ said uh, there um, maybe a little bit of a feeling of, of, of slightly being underwhelmed, I think was the, uh, the general feeling that I got back. Um, and I'll just go through a few points. So I'll kind of uh, switch screens um, and look across because, you know, I'm keen to, to, to uh, you know, communicate what, what came back from my colleagues rather than just talking from a, from a York perspective. Um, but I mean, the, the, you, you'll, you'll notice when I go down these points, there's, there's a, a consistent theme and it all comes down to money. Um, if I'm being honest, you know, seeing tangible money uh, that could actually you know, make tangible change, I suppose. So, I mean, I think just to, you know, to start off, I mean, I think uh, most people agreed that the, the 12 policy objectives, um, you know, seem to hit the right marks. I mean, that's, uh, that's a definite positive. And I suppose it won't be a surprise that, you know, the, the key uh, ones of interest to the uh, the bid directors were in the areas of regen and, and town centres, um, public transport, and also skills and employment. So, from a bids perspective, those are the ones that you know people were, were most interested in to to kind of scratch below the surface and, and have a little or have a more of an understanding of the detail. I think um, one thing which was a little bit surprising was we felt that maybe at headline level there wasn't quite enough on uh, quite enough reference to green. Um, and sustainable drivers, just considering, um, you know, I'm sure OG and, and other colleagues will agree with this, you know, in, in the past few years as the city centres, we understand that actually, you know, sustainability is going to be really at the heart of how, you know, city centres uh, regenerate, that they're themes that, you know, both businesses and, and the public are very interested in, you know, from a tourism perspective, we think they're going to be key drivers where people will make uh, decisions on on you know going to destinations so i think you know that was one thing that didn't kind of come across quite as strongly as maybe we expected i think um i mean going down these points i think um yeah i mean in, in terms of you know finance um you know it's just a question of you know where there is mention of some of the money it's, it's that understanding of what difference will it actually make when it's spread around so 
when it talks about the, um, the safer streets fund and, and kind of um, you know, references, you know, 50 million pounds around that. I suppose it's, you know, it's that thinking that once that is spread around, actually, what, what will that actually achieve? Um, it sounds like a lot of money, but if you're kind of spreading that across the regions, it's just actually what tangible difference that will make. I think in terms of, you know, um, devolution was obviously, you know, kind of you know, brought up. And I suppose that feeling from the Northern Bids directors that a real strong feeling that you know, there's got to be a real link between devolution and how any of this is going to happen. And again, you know, if, when, when, you know, clear ideas of money come through, that hope that that money would actually be really tied to decisions being made at a, at a, at a local level. Um, rather than I suppose local leaders having to go cap and hen down to London, you know, meet targets, um, you know, and, and the decisions being made elsewhere rather than that local, that local area. And I suppose, you know, coming from a, from a York perspective, you know, quite specifically, I think, um, you know, that, that regional understanding, which hopefully will come with devolution, you know, we, we feel is quite key because you know, York quite often misses out on, on central pots of money and, um, you know, I kind of understand why, because if you're looking at a place like York from uh, from an objective perspective, it looks like a you know quite a you know a wealthy city. Um, we have bounced back very well from COVID, so you know I'm not going to pretend that we have you know the issues that other cities do. We you know we, we do do well. However, you know at a local level, we do still have our our problems. I mean, people forget that you know York actually was built on very working class roots. You know, the railways, chocolate factories, um, a lot of that has obviously disappeared. Um, and so we don't necessarily have those those high skilled jobs. Um, we are quite reliant on, on on tourism. You know, it, it plays a big part. But we have our you know issues, and I can see my colleague from uh, Falmouth in, in Cornwall down down there will understand issues of actually you know affordability. You know, because a lot of um, you know our workers in the hospitality retail sector obviously are on huge wages, and yet the price of uh, of, of housing, cost of living in a place like York. Um, is very high and so that that causes problems with actually how, how do we get that workforce but we, we quite often miss out on these funding pots because we're seen to be as a city that you know on, on you know on, from the outside perspective looks to be doing well so I suppose the reason I tell that story is the fact that again any kind of money to do with leveling up I think really you know the devolution part is absolutely key because that understanding of those local dynamics uh, is going to be absolutely crucial. I think just going down um, again, just looking at what my colleagues have talked about. Um, I think again, you know, good to see the link with the High Street Task Force. You know, um, I mean, I think it is positive that there's, uh, you know, those um, those skills there to to help um, local authorities with economic master plans. Um, but I think again, there was a little bit of skepticism from the group that unless we can actually see tangible money to back up those master plans taking place. It's all very well having blueprints, but actually, how do you actually make those come to fruition? Um, a big one for my colleagues, probably in um, uh, places such as Bradford, Leeds, Newcastle, was public transport. Um, you know, for those of you who, who know the North, there's, there's long been talk about you know, better Trans-Pennine um, connections because, um, I mean, again, we're quite lucky in York because we can go east to west quite easily, but you know, um, going from Newcastle right through to, um, you know, like a Liverpool or Manchester, the connections are quite poor, um, much poorer than you think them to be. So, um, you know, real frustration that the, you know, the Northern Powerhouse Rail Project hasn't really had much momentum or hasn't, you know, has, hasn't, hasn't really um, you know, come to fruition as many would like to see. And I suppose, you know, again, when, when you look at, uh, you know, going back to some of Ojo's points about, you know, comparisons with London, which I mean, I know London is a different kettle of fish, but we naturally look down there. And um, yes, if you just look uh, at a recent NAO report, which put the cost of the, the Whitechapel station alone as part of Crossrail at a cost of one billion pounds just for one station, that's where sometimes we feel a little bit neglected in the north, I have to admit, and I'm sure regional colleagues will feel the same when we can't get together money um, to do um, you know, projects in, in our part of the world. Um, so I, mean, I suppose just to conclude as well, I mean, I think, you know, coming back to the money side of things, I think, I mean, the reason why, um, you know, from a bids perspective, because obviously like a lot of colleagues, you know, we, we get involved in, um, you know, putting on events and festivals uh, and various things, you know, to, 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 to draw footfall into cities. 
And, um, you know, it's been great to, to have, you know, ARG money and, uh, and, and likes over the past few years to, to really help that. I think, you know, um, speaking to our northern big colleagues, I, mean, I think there's that realisation. We all know that COVID has you know, sped up a lot of transformations with the high streets. And, you know, a lot of the challenges that were coming before COVID have, have been accelerated. We all know that. But a lot of that comes around. How do we reinvent our high streets? You know, um, you know what's going to be fit for purpose for the, for the coming 30, 40 years? Very different from, you know, the traditional high street. And that reshaping is is obviously going to need um, you know some, some serious money. I suppose what I mean by that is, you know, I don't think leveling up can be about you know handing out small amounts of money you know for events and festivals. We need to really reshape our cities. And you know, there's an increasing realization from bids that you know working with their local councils to really look at economic master plans that change the built environment. You know, reshape traditional high streets from you know that big floor pent retail breaking that down, you know, looking at leisure, green space, et cetera. Um, that's going to be absolutely key. And, and um, you know, that's why, again, going back to the previous points, things like, you know, High Street Task Force, helping local authorities with that capacity is going to be crucial. But again, until we see how there's going to be some serious money to back those plans up, um, that's probably going back to the start of, of what I was talking about, maybe why there was a little bit of uh, an underwhelming feeling from from some of my colleagues because um, until we get to see how there's going to be that tangible difference, um, it does feel like a little bit of a paper a paper exercise at the moment. So, so yeah, so I'm sure we could you know, we could talk about each uh, you know um, policy area in, in a lot more detail, but um, that hopefully just gives a little bit of an overview of, of what my colleagues said. And um, yeah, happy to uh, to open it up to the floor from there. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Andrew. I think um, most people would have seen that uh, Stephen's still having some technical issues. So Stephen, are, are you still able to hit? No. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take over chairing of, of, of the meeting um, from here on. Um, so Andrew, that was really useful, um, really illuminating. So thank you very much for that. Um, so any questions, whether for me, for Andrew, or just general comments, they would be more than welcome. Um, I'm just going to firstly um, see if I can uh, bring in um, Richard uh, Wilcox. You've made a really important comment, actually, around the issue of devolution and funding. Um, do you want to come in and just uh, explain a little bit more about the, the, the challenge for town and parish councils? Yeah, th thanks, OJ, and good morning, everyone. Good morning, um, Stephen. Um, just very quickly, I, I chair the South West Bridge Group, so I'm Andrew's counterpart, I suppose, for the southwest of England, covering sort of the three counties and representing over 6,000 business stakeholders. Um, yet, obviously, as, as many of us know, a lot of the play shaping groups and boards across the UK um, take place and are managed and operated by a variety of different partners, mainly driven through local councils, as well as working with town teams and bids. So the, the comment and, and query which I raised at the task force meeting last week, I'm raising again here, is, is really around that. And uh, if funds are passported to principal councils, then of course it will affect how we deliver some of the local projects within our respective towns and, uh, and areas. And there's just a need that if that is going to be the case, that it doesn't therefore become overly bureaucratic and a or political in respect of how that money then is filtered through to the various place shaping groups and boards and and, uh, and organisations who are doing such great work at the local level. And I think that's really quite important. And, and then lastly, OJ, I didn't put it in there, but absolutely critical that, uh, that the, uh, the small business voice is still heard. Uh, I think that independent business voice is crucial. So I welcome your comment at the outset around then not only being that key sectoral representation, but also the geographical representation, because you hit the nail on the head that coastal and rural voice is often overlooked when it comes to some of the national task force and, and policy rollout. So I welcome that comment you made. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Richard. And I know um, on both points on the issue of town and parish councils and whether they're able to get access to funding on the point around representation on the leveling up advisory council there's many other colleagues which have um, said very similar things so i think you'll find a lot of support for those comments um emma mcclarkin at uh, british beer and pub association can i bring you in i see you've got your hand up Good morning, everyone, um, and thank you for the introduction. You know, we have a real opportunity here with levelling up 
a lot of sectors have to really contort themselves to get into the leveling up box. But we very much feel that the high street, the businesses on the high street, and particularly from my perspective, um, our pubs are, are already delivering that. And we are already part of leveling up, operating in every part of the country. And we hope that we will continue to do so. But we really felt in the paper there was a missed opportunity um, to recognise maybe the levers that are already there that you can pull to operate, to deliver even more on levelling up. And the, the, we, we really felt that we were sort of overlooked in that regard as to what we can bring as hospitality to the table. So I hope that there'll be an opportunity for us to participate in the levelling up um, advisory council to, to directly tell you from our experience what we do every day, which is deliver jobs and, and boost to the local economy and really centering on place. Place and people is what we do. And so if the government choose to invest in us, then we can deliver even more for them when it comes to levelling up. So I, I know that many people perhaps on the call felt the same. Um, that there is more that we're already doing that we don't have to contort to fit into that box. So how can we um, continue to feed in you know, th this is the question I'm asking is that how can we continue to feed in? How can we put forward our ideas in a more structured format so that we can be recognised and what we can bring to the table? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And I know a number of people said um, exactly the same as that, um, uh, Emma. And I've got, actually, I've got a question for you. I know, and you might not be able to answer it, but I'm going to try anyway. So in the um, Leveling Up White Paper, there was reference to, if I remember correctly, local um, skills improvement plans, um, which will be um, employer-led um, in different areas, looking at helping to coordinate the skills provision for industry. Do you think um, some of your members would want to be uh, involved in that, given some of the challenges we've had in terms of skills and employment in the hospitality sector just recently? And given what you've said, I think quite rightly about the, the links between hospitality and levelling up. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, and as you know, we have a labour shortage in hospitality at this moment in time. So we are proactively looking um, for people to come and work in hospitality, but to invest in them and to train them up and to, to show that there is a, a long pathway in the careers that we've got there. And, and the relevance to what it means when it comes to the rejuvenation of high streets and communities is that we can make that offer. When you have a thriving um, hospitality venue, all the businesses around it benefit from that on the high street. And this is something that we can, can, can proactively put out there. And most people actually begin their career doing something in hospitality and, and sort of bringing those lower level entry jobs to the four and not calling them low skilled is, is a big start on this, but finding ways that we can begin that journey of training people up, skilling them up, bringing them in, giving them apprenticeships, um, and, and then really showing that there's a career that they can make in their local town. You know, a lot of people feel they have to move away to do that. This is, this is a career that can be on their doorstep and we would very much want to be showcasing what we can do. And I'm just about actually to go off to the, the House of Commons where we're doing an apprenticeship showcase this afternoon. Um, where our members are doing exactly that, saying what they're doing in terms of offering training and skilling up um, all over the country. Yeah, fabulous. Thank you for that. I think that that um, absolutely makes sense to me. Um, Paul Barnes, I see you've got your... Thank you. I was only following up on what uh, we've just been heard from the Beer and Pub Association about the training. I know it's slightly tangential, um, but just to let colleagues know here that uh, I speak from a New West End company uh, and the Knightsbridge Partnerships, which I know is in London, not you know outside the levelling up area. But for the first time ever, I am I think from a bid, um, Westminster City Council has just awarded our two bids a million pound contract to run a recruitment program for hospitality and leisure throughout the whole of Westminster, and we've managed to match fund that with two million pounds of training money. So as a bid or two bids together, we're now running a three million pound project for recruitment and training in hospitality and leisure. And I think that's the first time that local authorities have given that sort of responsibility and funding to business improvement districts to run a service for them. So we're hoping that it's going to become a, a sort of a pilot to say, look, local authorities, if you can trust us to do this and we deliver it well, which I'm hoping we are going to be able to do, uh, you can trust us to deliver other services for you. So I know it's a little tangential from this, but since it was just raised about uh, recruitment in hospitality, bids now, we've got a way into that. And I think there's a role for us across the country on that in the future. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. And Andrew Lowson, can I bring you back in? Yeah, I mean, I think just, um, I mean, just listening to those last two points, I think it highlights the importance of <clears throat> when some of these decisions are being made at what's done at local level, is that importance of partnership. Um, and actually, you know, because obviously in the past, these um, these kind of, you know, kind of schemes were very much, you know, local authority led. But I think uh, what Emma said and as what's just been you know, talked about down in London, it just shows that actually, you know, you're going to have to really demonstrate capacity in an area, you know, amongst partners. And I think, um, you know, again, if you look at one of the positives of, of, of COVID, and again, this has been communicated by quite a few of my colleagues at a northern level, it certainly happened in New York is actually a lot of local authorities have realized that you know there are these other delivery bodies these associations who can really help them with not only their decision making but sometimes the capacity of taking things forward um and i personally think that's going to be absolutely crucial because we all know again you know a lot of capacity within economic development teams at councils have, have been decimated you know going back to the you know the 2000 after the 2008 recession you know the skills and capacity isn't there so i think you have to show strong partner networks to actually be able to demonstrate how are you going to deliver these schemes? And, and funny enough, we're just, uh, you know, just very topical. There's a, there's a, there's a public realm piece in York around uh, the Clifford's Tower area, which is, um, you know, we're really hoping, you know, can take place. Uh, there's, there's a good master plan for it. Um, but it looks like the bid will be having to um, you know, put some, some money into actually, uh, you know, putting some evidence into, you know, some of the reasoning behind that, just because there isn't necessarily the money or the capacity within the local authority. So we're hoping that we will be able to contribute to make that, that scheme take place. And I'm sure we will all think of examples in our own areas where that's going to take place. But yeah, just wanted to kind of, you know, highlight that I think, you know, that this, this, um, these new types of partnerships that might not have been as, as, as clear a few years ago uh, are going to be crucial. And hopefully, again, when money's being awarded, um, that will be looked at at a local level um, to help decision making as to where the money should go. Yeah, thanks a lot for that. So there's there's actually I think I've been um, fairly mixed views around the white paper and the issues of partnerships. So I think there's been a lot of positive comments by the fact that there's so much emphasis behind public private partnerships in the white paper and that's absolutely the right thing and um, private sector has to have a, 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 a strong role in that but I think there was a little bit of concern it, it probably points back to um, Richard's comments around the nature of devolution when we talk about public sector it seems that the focus at the moment is quite heavily on um, mayoral combined authorities um, and also Count, um, county councils as well and principal councils but in terms of other forms of um, uh, local government I don't think that's been properly fleshed out and there's still also when we talk about public private partnerships at that pan sort of regional scale as well obviously LEPS used to play a key role and I think this white paper probably still leaves their future fairly unclear so we're hearing that mayoral combined authorities could well have the power to fold LEPs into whatever body they want. But outside mayoral combined authorities, they might be left to remain. So it's a little bit uncertain. It doesn't sound like there's a clear strategy for LEPs either. So there's lots to be said on the issues of partnership structures and um, certainly public private sectors working together. Um, Richard Wilcox, did you have your hand up? Was that a legacy hand or a new hand? No, it, it wasn't the legacy hand, actually, OJ, but I think the points have already been made. I was just going to really open-ended question from a bid sector perspective, obviously um, taking uh, my colleague's point there in, in Knightsbridge around that sort of trust in respect of strategy. Obviously, bids historically have been hugely seen as a, as a real asset for local authority and government, perhaps, around our operational capabilities to deliver the here and now. But we're now entering this new territory whereby we are perhaps needing to perhaps really look at our narrative as to how we present ourselves on that national scale so that we're seen as a key strategic um, body as much as we are operational and i know there's a lot of larger bids and others who are doing that so well but i just think there's probably a, a conversation outside of this meeting around that sort of whole marketing and brand so that bids are seen as a for the next 20 years strategic body as much as operational because that's exactly where we want to be we want to be at the front and center in respect of of strategic delivery in respect of the, the leveling up um so that was just an open-ended comment and, and thought out loud i think lisa um in the comment and chat sort of touches upon that sort of pointer as well 
Paul Barnes, can I bring you back in on that point? Yeah, I was just, uh, uh, just coming back in on that. Uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, the vids do a great role in terms of operational, uh, you know, street services, marketing, so on and so forth. But I think as we mature, there's other things we can do. And in particular, as, you know, money is tight, and it is, whatever we say, money is going to be tight, public sector money. Um, and what we need to be able to show is that if you partner up with us, you can get more bangs for your bucks. Uh, and already, even though you know we're only just starting this project with Westminster, I'd like to think they've been pleasantly surprised at the different approach that we, as private sector, have brought within the confines of ensuring that you know that we, uh, you know, uh, compliance and such like, because it is public money. But we brought a whole new look to this in a way they would never have been able to do. Um, and I, that's why I like this project as a pilot. Um, and we've managed to get UK hospitality to back it on the grounds that. You know, if this works well, we could look at it as, a, as you know, setting national standards for recruitment and training in hospitality and leisure in town centres. Um, so I think I think you're absolutely right, and that you know, this is our chance now to move to the next generation of bids, which is yes, we'll do the, we'll do all the um, uh, operational stuff, but actually we are the link between central government, sorry, between local government and business. Uh, and you should trust us more and use us more. We shouldn't just be an add-on. We should be real partners. And to some extent, as we're doing here, we should actually be delivering services for you. Well, that's um, that. That's really useful. And I think it, it's one of the things um, we've actually been working with Paul Barnes on is trying to understand the new types of models for supporting towns and city centres going forward, which will allow... Um, bids and other partners to progress and evolve in terms of the type of work they can do and I think actually um, British Property Federation based on the white paper is looking at exploring some of those very models um, and how they may be used as pilots through the white paper uh, which is uh, good to see um, so there's definitely an opportunity here to see what we can do in terms of change in the way we manage towns and city centres to be able to go beyond the operational and to be more strategic wherever we are in the country. Um, I want to try and get a retail perspective. So whether it's uh, Michael Whedon or um, uh, Steve Dallin or Sophie Fisher, if anybody wants to jump in and give us a retail perspective on uh, the levelling up white paper, that'll be uh, really useful. Don't all jump in at once. Hi, I'm here. Hi, Brill. Hi, Michael. Oh, we can't see your cameras um, pointing oh. to the ceiling. <laughs> oh, it's the it's the wrong camera. Wait, uh, talk to somebody else. I'll come back in a second. Okay. Well, I have, <laughs> no problem. I have multiple cameras here. No problem. No problem. Firstly, um, um, Alex um, Hagman. I hope I've pronounced that right. Um, has posed a question saying that in the white paper, um, it is said that. Um, the government is committing to exploring the devolution of business rates um, to local authorities um, and wants to ask if people would welcome um, this particular measure, um, which I'll, I'll need to take a look at that in more detail. And I know it's a little bit confusing as we've had the business rates retention scheme. So the devolution of business rates will be something interesting. So um, Alex, do you want to come in and explain a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, to post the extract in the chat. It, it's quite short and vague. It, it really does just uh, commit to exploring it, nothing more. I'd just be interested to hear the industry perspective as to whether or not people see the devolution of business rates as something that would benefit local communities or if there's a preference to uh, kind of retain uniformity and have a national system. No, I think, I think that's a really good question. I really think that's a really good question. Emma, you've got your hand up. I think on, on the devolution um, and local authority perspective, it depends on your local authority. If you've got a friendly one, then you probably think that that's a great idea. If, if you don't, it, it could maybe go a bit awry. Um, but what needs to be tackled full stop, and, and that would need to happen even if it's at national level or, or at that local level, is the unfairness that we see. And that's got to be part of levelling up is that there's fair taxation that's part of that. And, you know, there's a disproportionate amount of business rates paid versus their turnover when it comes to the pub sector 
and I'm sure other people will have uh, other examples of, of where they, they feel there is an imbalance in the taxation um, for our businesses. So I think that we need to examine how we go to respond to this suggestion, um, uh, but we need to keep pushing collectively for fair taxation, full stop, uh, and investments in bricks and mortar. Uh, that's the, the heart of our, our, our rejuvenation of uh, towns and communities, and we need to see that readdressed. So, you know, something like the consultation on online sales tax might be an opportunity for us to, again, push as part of levelling up that we need to see fair taxation across the board, but particularly on business rates. No, well, this the, it's, this exact point came up in the last APPG meeting we had on the cost of living crisis and the fact that one of the easiest ways to support businesses have a fairer taxation system when it comes to business rates and look at having some form of parity between the use of physical space and selling through <clears throat> digital channels. So, um, yeah, this this issue comes up again and again and again. Um, on this point, Michael Whedon, can I, can I bring you in? And also, if you wanted to give us your retail perspective on the white paper as well. Yes, thank you. You'll have to do without the video, frankly. I have a technical problem. So we can all look at OJ instead, which is fine. Um, but I'll just talk on a couple of points that we want to make. On that business rates issue, um, we are strongly discouraged by the lack of information which we found in the white paper. But actually, we were already discouraged because we've been involved with the Treasury, particularly on what they call technical consultations for several months now uh, on a number of matters. And I have to say, at the very first of those, um, when the message came that we consider fundamental reform of business rates to be moving to three yearly revaluations, re my heart sank. And it hasn't risen since then. Um, I see no evidence. Well, in fact, the evidence is that the government's got no intention of reforming business rates. Uh, Rishi Sunak said that in the autumn statement, and that's exactly what we hear when we sit down and talk to the Treasury and the VOA. We need to revive that discussion because I believe they think that that subject is sorted. Um, it, is, it is therefore not surprising to us to find that it's not something which featured in the white paper here. But I think we need to collectively, this, this group and others, to try and revive the issue because the only move we can see where they want to make changes are these technical matters about moving to three yearly revaluations, but also looking at still online taxes, sales on online businesses and so forth. We think that will take them a long time. I think that's run into the sand and I think the Treasury is very happy with that. So there's another discussion about that. On the, on the wider front, our big concern, retail fits into it, but as the FSB, we've got 25,000 members in retail, but many more around that as well, is that our big concern is about time with all of this, looking at the, um, at the white paper, in fact, asking questions of Neil O'Brien about this yesterday. He happens to be my local MP as well as the, you know, one of the leveling up ministers and a major author of all of this is this move to um, the prioritization of funding through mayoral combined authorities and also county deals and then working down in priority just says to me it's going to take a lot of time to organize if, for example, um, a region decides it's going to put in place. Um, a combined authority, you've got a gap in timing there. Whatever the availability of money, it's not going to get spent until that final form of government, which is going to handle the money, is in place. And as ever with this, we've got to think who's got the money, who's channeling the money. So one of our big concerns, and you're absolutely spot on, OJ, talking about let's, we think they're going to get lost in the wash. They didn't get taken out of the wash in the white paper. But just the fact that we see that in combined authority areas, we will expect, and people who I know are on boards of LEPs in combined authority areas, we can expect them to be folded into the combined authority so the funding goes through that instead. You wonder where the rest of the LEPs go. And we have a particular concern with this because it's not just about what has been ERDF funding, which has been critical over the last few years, but the Shared Prosperity Fund um, as well. It's where we go with this in the future. And that time gap seems to me to be one of the things which is not addressed in the white paper. It's all about intentions at a point. There are a few dates in it, but our concern is it falls in the gap in the middle. Now, everyone who dealt with government for any time, and you know, OJ, you know, you know this on a day-to-day -day basis, between the announcement and the implementation of things, 
is a huge gap. And what happens in the gap is nothing. Now, the reason we're particularly concerned about LEPS is not just about funding, but also because LEPS run, um, they run uh, the, the business support hubs for small businesses. That is actually the primary point of contact between small businesses and LEPS. And actually, if you think about some of the LEPS on the moment, say SEMLEP, which covers a multitude of counties, of counties rather, if we go from no combined authority in the area, which is likely in many places in the country, to county deals, well, that one covers multiple counties. So what does that one kind of get chopped up into bits? Is there no LEP in that area? We're, we're worried about this, but our main concern, as I say, is about time. Those are the, those are the issues that we would uh, be concentrating on. I have to say, and we are hopeful, and we think it is absolutely important we find out as soon as possible, which organizations are going to be on that advisory group for leveling up. Thank you. You can't see me, but I'm stopping now. <laughs> that's that's brilliant, Michael. I think they're all um, really um, e e excellent comments. Um, so thank you very much for that. And I, I, I think there's so many people that echo your concerns. I know particularly Richard Wilcox, who has mentioned some of these things to me as well. Um, time for one more comment. So Steve Dowling, um, Association of Convenience Stores, can I come to you before we uh, wrap up? Yeah, sure. Thanks, AJ. And um, sorry, no camera. I've got some work going on, so there might be some background noise. But just quickly, because of time, um, I think on business rates, we need to step back and think, what is the key issue here? And that is that the rate of the tax continues to go up for retailers and other high street uses, because that tax has to raise the same amount of revenue, regardless of the broader economic circumstances. How do you change that to, to, to bring more vitality into these places? You can't increase VAT because that's not, frankly, politically viable at the moment. You can't look at domestic taxation for similar reasons. So how else do you, do you raise this, the same revenue for public services? And that's looking at how we tax online retail versus physical bricks and mortar retail. Um, and I think that brings you to the Treasury's current online sales tax consultation, which is key for this. And where I think we are politically is Michael Gove and the Department for Leveling Up is quite pro on this for restoring pride in place, supporting high streets, leveling up. The Treasury, you know, the, the, the Treasury's instinct is if it doesn't raise money overall, then we're not too interested. So that's where we are at the moment in, in terms of that. And I think that's key in terms of what happens in business rates. But I completely agree with, with Michael that in terms of the business rate system itself, we're not going to see much fundamental reform there, but it's about could an online sales tax, the revenues from that be used to offset bills for retailers. Two other quick points key from the, the white paper for us. Um, it talks about rural proofing in there. I think we need to also remember our, our, our quite rural high streets and places and, and, um, and what that means. So the role for DEFRA there and also for retail um, developing an in-work progression offer. Um, so you know attracting talent into retail that sees it as a, as, as a you know a sector that you can grow and develop strong careers in wherever you are in the country as well which is a lot of potential there but uh, what happens there but that was a bit quick but i'll leave it there no thanks a lot steve that's really useful um and certainly i i, I agree with a lot of that as well um thanks a lot everybody for your um comments I, I have to say there's not a lot I've heard here which particularly surprises me about some of the concerns and, and the questions we have around the levelling up uh, white paper to ensure we can maximise some of the opportunities. Um, we've had about four MPs listening in, um, most of whom from um, uh, constituencies based in the north. Um, so what we'll do as an APPG, I know Stephen's had to drop off because of his technical problems, so I will catch up with him later today um, and we will see what we can do about possibly put, put in some of these uh, comments and questions in some uh, form of a formal engagement with um, one of the ministers at the Department for Leveling Up to see what it is we can do to to push on some of the, the key issues mentioned most by people. Um, like I say, some of these issues have actually been discussed, have been discussed in recent APPG meetings. And um, dare I say that, that some of the MPs will agree with, with um, some of the comments made. 
Um, so leave it with us and we will we will see what we can do around that engagement with the Department for Lovely Milk. So everyone, thank you very much for your time. Uh, great to see you. Um, and I hope to catch up with you all soon. Cheers, everyone.